Hello, I'm Paula Davidson. I'm the director of the Greensboro Free Library. And welcome. This is our librarian reading event that goes along with our annual chili dinner. In past years, we've had a youth talent show, and last year we did that as a recording. But we decided this year to hold off until spring in the hopes that we could do that as an in-person event, uh, hopefully in our nice backyard space. So instead, we are going to invite you to listen to readings by myself and also Emily Purdy, our youth librarian, and McKenna LaPierre, our assistant librarian. When I was thinking about what to read, I remembered my mom used to read James Harriet books. He wrote All Creatures Great and Small and many sequels to it. And she would just sit in a chair a lot like this one and she would laugh until tears were coming down her face just being so entertained by these stories. So I looked through them, and a lot of them you have to read in context, but I found one I really liked. Um, and I also wanted to point out that it's been newly adapted uh, for TV. It's on, running on PBS right now, for those of you who would like to watch a show. But the one I found is in a book that we have called The Best of James Harriet, so a collection of stories. Uh, by James Harriet, with some interesting details on the side that really give you context um, for these stories. And this is a story called A Lesson from a Coleman's Horse. I could look back now on six months of hard practical experience. I had treated cows, horses, pigs, dogs, and cats seven days a week. In the morning, afternoon, evening, and through the hours when the world was asleep. I had calved cows and farrowed sows till my arms ached and the skin peeled off. I had been knocked down, trampled on, and sprayed liberally with every kind of muck. I had seen a fair cross-section of the diseases of animals. And yet, a little voice had begun to niggle at the back of my mind. It said I knew nothing, nothing at all. This was strange because those six months had been built upon five years of theory a slow, painful assimilation of thousands of facts and a careful storage of fragments of knowledge like a squirrel with its nuts. Beginning with a study of plants and the lowest forms of life, working up to dissection in the anatomy lab, and physiology in the vast, soulless territory of Materia Medica. Then pathology, which tore down the curtain of ignorance and let me look for the first time into the deep secrets and parasitology, the teeming other world of the worms and fleas and mange mites. Finally, medicine and surgery. The crystallization of my learning and its application to the everyday troubles of animals. And there were many others, like physics, chemistry, hygiene. They didn't seem to have missed a thing. Why then should I feel that I knew nothing? Why had I begun to feel like an astronomer looking through a telescope at an unknown galaxy? This sensation that I was only groping about on the fringes of limitless space was depressing. It was a funny thing because everybody else seemed to know all about sick animals. The chap who held the cow's tail, the neighbor from the next farm, men in pubs, jobbing gardeners, they all knew and were free and confident with their advice. I tried to think back over my life. Was there any time when I had felt this supreme faith in my knowledge? And then I remembered. I was back in Scotland, I was 17, and I was walking under the arch of the Veterinary College into Montrose Street. I had been a student for three days, but not until this afternoon had I felt the thrill of fulfillment. Messing about with botany and zoology was all right, but this afternoon had been the real thing. I had had my first lecture in animal husbandry. The subject had been the points of the horse. Professor Grant had hung up a life-size picture of a horse and gone over it from nose to tail, indicating the withers, the stifle, the hawk, the pole, and all the other rich equine terms. And the professor had been wise. To make his lecture more interesting, he kept throwing in little practical points, like, this is where we find curb, or here's the site for wind gals. He talked of thorough pins and side bones, side bones, splints and quitter, things the students wouldn't learn about for another four years, but it brought it all to life. The words were still spinning in my head as I walked slowly down the sloping street. This was what I had come for. 
I felt as though I had undergone an initiation and become a member of an exclusive club. I really knew about horses. And I was wearing a brand new riding mac with all sorts of extra straps and buckles which slapped against my legs as I turned the corner of the hill into busy Newton Road. I could hardly believe my luck when I saw the horse. It was standing outside the library below Queen's Cross like something left over from another age. It drooped dispiritedly between the shafts of a coal cart which stood like an island in an eddying stream of cars and buses. Pedestrians hurried by, uncaring, but I had the feeling that fortune was smiling upon me. A horse. Not just a picture, but a real, genuine horse. Stray words from the lecture floated up into my mind. The pastern, the cannon bone, coronet, and all those markings. Snip, blaze, white sock near the hind. I stood on the pavement and examined the animal critically. I thought it must be obvious to every passerby that here was a true expert. Not just an inquisitive onlooker, but a man who knew and understood all. I felt clothed in a visible aura of horsiness. I took a few steps up and down, hands deep in the pockets of the new riding mac, eyes probing for possible shoeing faults or curbs or bog spavins. So thorough was my inspection that I worked round to the offside of the horse and stood perilously among the racing traffic. I glanced around at the people hurrying past. Nobody seemed to care, not even the horse. He was a large one, at least 17 hands, and he gazed apathetically down the street, easing his hind legs alternatively in a bored manner. I hated to leave him, but I had completed my examination. It was time I was on my way. But I felt that I ought to make a gesture before I left something to communicate to the horse that I understood his problems and that we belong to the same brotherhood. I stepped briskly forward and patted him on the neck. Quick as a striking snake, that horse whipped downwards and seized my shoulder in, its, in his great strong teeth. He laid back his ears, rolled his eyes wickedly and hoisted me up almost off my feet. I hung there helplessly suspended like a lopsided puppet. I wriggled and kicked, but the teeth were clamped immovably in the material of my coat. There was no doubt about the interest of the passers-by now. The grotesque sight of a man hanging from a horse's mouth brought them to a sudden halt and a crowd formed with people looking over each, other's, over each other's shoulders and others fighting at the back to see what was going on. A horrified old lady was crying, Oh, poor boy! Help him, somebody! Some of the braver characters tried pulling at me, but the horse wickered ominously and hung on tighter. Conflicting advice was shouted from all sides. With deep shame, I saw two attractive girls in the front row giggling helplessly. Appalled at the absurdity of my position, I began to thrash about wildly. My shirt collar tightened around my throat, and a stream of the horse's saliva trickled down the front of my mac. I could feel myself choking and was giving up hope when a man pushed his way through the crowd. He was very small. Angry eyes glared from a face blackened by coal dust. Two empty sacks were draped over an arm. What the hell is this? he shouted. A dozen replies babbled in the air. Can you no leave a bloody horse alone? He yelled into my face. I made no reply, being pop-eyed, half-throttled, and in no mood for conversation. The coalman turned his fury on the horse. Drop him, you big bastard! Go on, let go! Drop him! Getting no response, he dug the animal viciously in the belly with his thumb. The horse took the point at once and released me like an obedient dog dropping a bone. I fell on my knees and ruminated in the gutter for a while till I could breathe more easily. As from a great distance, I could still hear the little man shouting at me. After some time, I stood up. The coal man was still shouting, and the crowd was listening appreciatively. What do you think you're playing at? Keep your hands off my bloody horse. Get the police to you. I looked down at my new Mac. The shoulder was chewed to a sodden mass. I felt I must escape and began to edge my way through the crowd. Some of the faces were concerned, but most were grinning. Once clear, I started to walk away rapidly, and as I turned the corner, 
The last faint cry from the coal man reached me. Dinner meddle with things ye can nothing about. <laughs> so that's one of the funny stories of James Harriet. We have several books by him here, and so if you haven't read some of his stories, I really encourage you to read some more. I also have in front of me some of our many wonderful cookbooks. So since this is tied to the chili dinner, I couldn't help but promote some of them. We have lots of new books from America's Test Kitchen. And this is one that I just had at home for a few weeks called The Complete Autumn and Winter Cookbook that has kind of focuses on topics like apples and pumpkins that we deal, think about more in the winter. Um, but we have these and many more if you'd like to come and check out some books and do some cooking or check out some James Harriet books for some very enjoyable reading. Next, I'll pass it on to Emily. Hello, I'm Emily Prudy, and I am the children's librarian here at the Greensboro Free Library. And I am going to be reading you this story, Our Little Kitchen by Jillian Tamaki. Uh, we did get a, um, Jillian was kind enough to let us read her book and she illustrated it as well as wrote the words. You can see there's a lot going on here. This is how to make vegetable soup. Hi. Hello. Every Wednesday we come together in this little kitchen. Hello. Hello. Our little kitchen, a tiny small place, is just big enough. So squeeze in and make space. Tie on your apron, roll up your sleeves. Pans are out, oven is hot, the kitchen's all ready. Where do we start? Well, let's look around and see what we've got. We've grown, what we've kept, we've been given and bought. All we need is around us, we just need to look. See how our little garden has grown? Remember how we pushed seeds into the soil one by one? Tomatoes are ripe, I'll pick a few. Look at these zooks, let's use them up too. These carrots though, still very small. The lettuce is holy, bugs ate it through. I found some carrots, just a week or two old. Half of a celery, 10 radishes, oh. Don't know what this is, but it's gotta go. The bakery brought us some day-old loaves. A minute in the oven, maybe two, soft and warm, good as new. You can see how there's these speech bubbles where people are talk, different people are talking and telling their stories. The three bags of apples, some of them bruised. Cut off the brown bits, they're still good to use. A few sticks of butter, cinnamon, sugar, oats from the cupboard, a sweet apple crumble. Even the kids are helping. Beans from the food bank, third week in a row, but it's what we've got, we'll use them somehow. Bean salad, bean soup, bean tacos, bean stew, I'm out of ideas, what about you? Glug, 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 our little kitchen's really cooking now. Listen to the delicious music we make. Sizzle, chop, 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 pick, sprinkle. Slice, peel, splash, trim, toss, squish, beep. Mmm, 15 minutes. Here come the early birds. Grab your favorite seat. How is life treating you? How is your week? Good to see you. New haircut? Nice weather. It's all right. Fork, knife, and spoon. Now roll it up tight. Ten more minutes. And still so much to do. Behind you, watch out. Salad coming through. It looks like we're having chili again. Yay, chili. 
Those who didn't cook don't get to complain. Well, it's not perfect, but it's the best I could do. Two minutes left, let's wrap it up, crew. Already can't be. Where's the salt? Where's the cheese? Give me one minute, just one more sec, please. No, 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 no. Our neighbors are waiting. I mean it. Let's go. Ah! Here it all comes. Everyone's excited. There's even music. Everyone brings what they can to a community supper. Everyone's getting what they want, choosing different things. The best sound in the world is slurp. Is your body warm? Is your belly full? Everyone's having different conversations. You can see here some of the things that people are talking about. One little kitchen can't give us all that we need, but who would like seconds? Delicious as always. And a kiss on the cheek. Have a nice evening. See you next week. Okay, time to clean up. This little kid wants to go home. All done cooking for the day. The end. And then there's a little bit about the author and about her experience and the recipe for apple crumble on the back, vegetable soup on the front, and apple crumble on the back. So I chose this book for you because I liked the idea of everyone cooking together and it's such a special way that people of all ages and abilities can do things together and um, in thinking about food. I also chose some of the food books that we have here at the Greensboro Free Library that you can check out. Um, some of them have recipes, some of them are stories. A lot of uh, family history gets passed on through food. So come in and check some out. Thank you. Hello, I'm McKenna Lapeer, Assistant Librarian here at Greensboro Free Library, and I am going to be reading a chapter out of Blackie the Crow by Thornton W. Burgess. I picked this book because he's written many of them, and they were some of my favorites when I was younger, so I hope you enjoy. Blackie the Crow, Chapter 1. Blackie the Crow Makes a Discovery. Blackie the Crow is always watching for things not intended for his sharp eyes. The result is that he gets into no end of trouble which he could avoid. In this respect, he is just like his cousin Sammy Jay. Between them, they see a great deal which they have no business and which it would be better for them not to see. Now Blackie the Crow finds it no easy matter to pick up a living when snow covers the green meadows and the green forest, and ice binds the big river and the smiling pool. He has to use his sharp eyes for they all for all they are worth in order to find enough to fill his stomach, and he will eat anything in the way of food that he can swallow. Often he travels long distances looking for food, but at night he always comes back to the same place in the green forest to sleep in company with others of his family. Blackie dearly loves company, particularly at night, and about the time jolly round red Mr. Sun is beginning to think about his bed behind the purple hills, you will find Blackie heading for a certain part of the green forest where he knows he will have neighbors of his own kind. Peter Rabbit says that it is because Blackie's conscience troubles him so that he doesn't dare sleep alone, but Happy Jack Squirrel says that Blackie hasn't any conscience. You can believe just what you please, though I suspect that neither of them really knows. As I have said, Blackie is quite a traveler at this time of year, and sometimes his search for food takes him to out-of-the-way places. One day, toward the very last of winter, the notion entered, entered his black head that he would have a look in a certain lonesome corner of the green forest, where once upon a time Redtail the hawk had lived. Blackie knew well enough that Redtail wasn't there now. He had gone south in the fall and wouldn't be back until he was sure that Mistress Spring had arrived on the green meadows and in the green forest. Like the black imp he is, Blackie flew over the treetops, his sharp eyes watching for something interesting below. Presently, he saw ahead of him the old nest of Redtail. He knew all about that nest. He had visited it before when Redtail was away. Still, it might be worth another visit. 
You never can tell what you may find in old houses. Now, of course, Blackie knew perfectly well that Redtail was miles and miles, hundreds of miles away, and so there was nothing to fear from him. But Blackie learned ever so long ago that there is nothing like making sure that there is no danger. So instead of flying straight to that old nest, he first flew around the tree so that he could look down into it. Right away, he saw something that made him gasp and blink his eyes. It was quite large and white, and it looked, it looked very much indeed like an egg. Do you wonder that Blackie gasped and blinked? Here was snow on the ground, and rough brother Northwind and Jack Frost had given no hint that they were even thinking of going back to the far north. The idea of anyone laying an egg at this time of year. Blackie flew over to a tall pine tree to think it over. Must be it was a little lump of snow, thought he. Yet if ever I saw an egg, that looked like one. Jumping grasshoppers, how good an egg would taste right now. You know Blackie has a weakness for eggs. The more he thought about it, the hungrier he grew. Several times he almost made up his mind to fly straight over there and make sure, but he didn't quite dare. If it were an egg, it must belong to somebody, and perhaps it would be best to find out who. Suddenly, Blackie shook himself. I must be dreaming, said he. There couldn't, there just couldn't be an egg at this time of year, or in that old tumble-down nest. I'll just fly away and forget it. So he flew away, but he couldn't forget it. He kept thinking of it all day, and when he went to sleep that night, he made up his mind to have another look at that old nest. That was the end of chapter one, and if you enjoyed it, you'll have to come into the library and check out Blackie the Crow by Thornton W. Burgess. And when you come, you can look at all the other new books and old books that we have, and I hope that you find something you love. I hope you enjoyed our librarian's read aloud this evening. And I just wanted to let you know we plan to do more programs like this to bring the library to you in your homes through Hardwick Community Television. So in the meantime, you're welcome to come into the library and see us in person and check out some books. We hope to see you soon.